Welcome, everybody. I'm Paul Pepys, the director of the Oregon Humanities Center at the University of Oregon. And I'd like to ask you, I'd like to welcome you to this talk presented by the Humanities Center. Um, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions after the talk. Please use the chat function of Zoom, and you can access that uh, function by hovering over the bottom of your Zoom window with your cursor. The questions will be moderated by me and my co-hosts, and I will ask them of our speaker. The talk is being recorded and will be available for viewing later today on the Oregon Humanities Center's website and YouTube channel. So it gives me great pleasure now to introduce our speaker, John Fronmeyer. Fronmeyer is a retired lawyer who received his law degree from the U of O in 1972. He is a former chair of the National Endowment for the Arts. He is the brother of the late Dave Fronmeyer, who was president of the University of Oregon from 1994 to 2009. John Fronmeyer was selected by President George H.W. Bush to chair the NEA in 1989. He took over during a turbulent time when cultural conservatives were attacking the agency for funding work by such controversial artists as Robert Maplethorpe and Andreas Serrano. During his tenure at the NEA, he attempted to rebuild the agency's morale, support important artwork, and respond to congressional critics who inserted a decency clause into the agency's funding. Fronmeyer's NEA uh, position became untenable and he resigned in April uh, 1992. He's written the books, Leaving Town Alive, Confessions of an Arts Warrior, and Out of Tune, Listening to the First Amendment, as well as others. His most recent book is Carrying the Clubs, What Golf Teaches Us About Ethics. Uh, Fronmeyer, who is a competitive master's rower, he's a singer and guitar player, is also a frequent author of commentaries for print and radio. And you can learn more about John at johnfronmeyer.com. The title of John's talk today is What is the Role of Ethics in a Post-Truth World? Welcome, John. It's great to have you with us. Thank you, Paul. And it's uh, nice for me to see the pictures and names of a number of people that I know. I wish uh, you were there in the audience where I could actually shake your hand, but I don't think shaking hands is going to be anything we're doing anytime soon. Let me start uh, with three disclaimers here. And that, the first is that I am speaking for myself and so that the ideas that I am presenting are not those of the Oregon Humanities Center, the Oregon Humanities Center is uh, providing the soapbox and, and the ideas are mine and I'm very thankful so to the Oregon Humanities Center for making this forum available. Um, the second is that the talk that I'm going to give was written uh, and, and scheduled uh, by the Humanities Center before the COVID-19 pandemic uh, became so real and absolutely um, took away all of the uh, oxygen from the room. Um, I have not attempted to revise it except in some minor particulars, and I don't think any of us will mind not talking about COVID-19 uh, for a few minutes. <clears throat> the third, uh, I would say, is that I do not belong to any political party and have actually in writing and uh, in speaking urged my friends to dump theirs. So with those disclaimers, uh, let me tell you about the, uh, the origin of this particular piece. I have always been interested in the disconnect between legal ethics and philosophical ethics. And so um, probably around six months ago, I approached the editor of the um, Oregon Bar Bulletin, which is the house organ for Oregon lawyers, uh, and uh, floated this idea, with, which he was enthusiastic about. And so I set out to write the piece. I wrote it. I sent it in. And a couple of weeks later, I got a uh, email back from him that absolutely floored me. I have it here. And let me just read a couple of parts of it. Um, I found myself cheering as I read the article, but I don't think the bulletin can print it for the very reason that it needs to be printed. Um, he said, the passion with which it is written will be seen to be political and that may offend lawyers, some lawyers. Of course, offending lawyers would be the stock and trade of most people in society, but we'll, uh, we'll see as you hear this particular presentation whether you think it's something that would be offensive. Okay, so that's, <clears throat> that's where we're starting. Here we go. There is a vast gulf between 
legal ethics and philosophical ethics. By the former, we make a living, by the latter, a life. Legal ethics requires us to be competent, diligent, honest, dedicated, trustworthy, almost the same as the Boy Scout oath leaving out the thrifty, courteous, and kind parts. They regulate a profession where we act as fiduciaries, advocates, and protectors of our clients, and thus we shouldn't steal from them, lie to them, ignore them, or sell them out. From a philosophical standpoint, that's pretty thin gruel. What duty do we have to the society as a whole, to future generations? What about our dedication to the metaphysical big three of justice, truth, and beauty? A fundamental of nearly every ethical system is some form of the golden rule, that is, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. As a lifelong trial lawyer, I can assure you that that is not what lawyers do. The side with the most power routinely tries to bury the other with document dumps, outrageous, burdensome, and expensive discovery requests, endless deposition, delays, and misdirection. We pride ourselves on our art, and the last thing we seek is a level playing field. The rule here is not the least bit golden. Winning is what counts. What's more, the justice system is not really about justice. It is about finality. It is about the practical plumber patching the pipes so that they don't leak anymore. Law and ethics have traditionally played discrete and separate roles in our society. The law says you can or you can't, and if you do or you don't, you will be put in jail or fined or punished somehow. Ethics, on the other hand, says that you should or you shouldn't, and if you do or you don't, your reward will be self-imposed, that is, guilt or regret, or by society in shame or exclusion. That's all changing, and here's why. Truth-telling is at the heart of moral instruction for most children. It is a patriotic good as well as a social one. George Washington is revered as one who confessed that he chopped down the cherry tree. Abe Lincoln is honest Abe. And we know that commerce is based upon the truth, that a dollar is worth a dollar, that a person's word is her bond, and that the contents of a prospectus for stocks are accurate. The law is equipped to deal with falsehood. One of the three exceptions to the absolute protection of the First Amendment, which is Congress shall pass no law regarding speech, press, petition, and assembly, is fraud, forgery, bribery, perjury, and some other similar untruths. Those of us receiving religious education as children learned of another kind of truth, namely that of a revealed religion. And here, the Torah, the Quran, and the New Testament are similar in that God is declared to be the source of all truth. Moses sees God in a cloud and God proclaims himself to be, quote, abundant in goodness and truth, Exodus 34, 6. God is the truth, says the Quran, 22, 6. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free, John 8, 32. The pivotal, pivotal exchange in Christianity is at Jesus' trial when Pilate asks, what is truth? And Jesus responds that those who believe know the truth. That's John 18, 38. The two kinds of truth, that is truth based upon facts and truth based upon revelation, coexisted for generations, the secular one being based upon facts that were provable in accord and the religious one being based on a matter of belief on religious conviction as protected by the First Amendment. And then in the first part of the 21st century, facts took a Nietzschean turn Nietzsche being the philosopher who said that there are no eternal facts and there are no absolute truths. Reality and belief merged. History became what one wanted it to be. Facts were no longer persuasive. Facts were in fact not facts. 
And truth came, became what comedian Stephen Colbert labeled as truthiness, that is a belief that something is true based upon intuition or perception without regard to evidence, logic, intellectual examination, or facts. There can be no democratic government when two branches, the judicial and the legislative branches, are based upon telling the truth and the executive branch charged with enforcing the laws is totally unacquainted with it. Witnesses in the judicial system are sworn to tell the truth and juries are uh, sworn to find the facts truthfully. In Congress, if you testify, you are usually sworn and if you are, uh, utter falsehoods, you can be held in contempt of Congress. So here is where legal ethics becomes relevant beyond lawyers just keeping their licenses. Oregon Revised Statutes 9.460 lists the duties of an attorney to support the Constitution of the United States and this state, to employ only such means as are consistent with the truth, and never to seek to mislead the court or jury by any artifice or false statement of law or fact. Thus, while the rest of our citizens, and particularly those who have been elected and have chosen to place loyalty to a political party above loyalty to the Constitution, may choose to argue from a fact-free foundation, we as lawyers have an obligation to the facts and the truth. And while one of the least endearing of lawyers' skills, that is making arguments with absolutely no merit seem as if they have some, need, need not be entirely lost, I think we do have some obligation to annoy the public. Or Oregon Rules of Professional Conduct 4.1 prohibits lawyers from making false statements of law or fact. In short, both legal and philosophical ethics require a dedication to truth based upon fact. Sounds simple, isn't it? Here are just a couple of impediments to ethical action. Stare decisis, um, and by the way, lawyers do resort to talking in Latin when we want to be obscure. Stare decisis means the law is difficult to change. Uh, stare decisis means that you have to follow precedent. That's cases that have been decided before in your jurisdiction. It gives certainty, that is, uh, which is important, but it also begs the question that should be asked, namely, is this how the law should be? Many of our laws are so ingrained and so unfair that people despair of getting anything other than screwed. Take, for example, the thousands of pages of the tax code written to benefit the least deserving. According to a Washington Post survey in December 2019, about 400 of America's largest corporations paid an average federal tax rate of 11.3% on their 2018 profits, roughly half of what they were supposed to pay under the tax cut in 2017. 91 of the Fortune 500 companies paid no federal tax at all. Amazon paid an effective tax rate on $13 billion worth of revenue of 1.2%. Plus, it has a $1.7 billion tax credit against future taxes. My law professor, my tax professor in law school would applaud. It's a game, he said. He'd say it again and again, and it's a game. It is a highly immoral, thoroughly rigged game of pay to play. And that's not what the law should be. And yes, I know there can be dozens of counter arguments as only we lawyers can make why this is ultimately good for society, but it is an unjust society where the rich pay less than the poor. One more impediment, and then go, we'll go on to thinking about maybe getting around to perhaps doing something someday. Abraham Maslow's oft quoted observation that if the only tool you have is a hammer, everything begins to look like a nail, is fitting in that we deal with every issue as if it were a political problem. Democracy under the constitution that we are sworn to protect is much more than politics. In fact, politics is or should be a minor part of a functioning democracy instead of having, <clears throat> but, but 
here's, here's the rub. Instead of having the moral debate about what we value and how we would like our society to function, we simply hurl political epithets at each other and we never get to the fundamental questions. Should everyone have decent shelter, food, education, healthcare, individual dignity? If not, why not? Who is excluded and why? If we are clear on those values, then we can tackle the incremental and political questions of how we get there. Without the moral debate first, progress remains in the dumpster. Our democratic and moral values that are lost in the lost and found are a sense of community, of common goals, of inclusion, trust and generosity of spirit, of respect for differences, giving a sucker a break, of recognizing that we cannot know where the other person's shoe pinches. We have forgotten the most critical of democratic principles, and that is that every one of us has something to contribute, and it is the sum total of those contributions that makes our society strong. We need a new social contract, one that we think about, debate, and collectively adopt that reflects how we want to live together. On 9-11, when the terrorists brought down the Twin Towers and crashed into the Pentagon and hijacked Flight 93, President George W. Bush urged us to go shopping. I know that his intent was to restore a sense of normalcy, but is shopping what defines us? What do we care about? What are we willing to die for? What do we want to leave as our legacy for our children? Do we want to keep living in silos where everyone has his own set of facts? Is lying the new norm for public officials? These are moral issues that have to coalesce into a new common societal belief before they can be made into law. Laws don't work without voluntary compliance. Think of prohibition and the 55 mile an hour speed limit. If most people don't voluntarily comply, a law is unenforceable. If we are to have a new social contract, it will not be the politicians who write it. It will be the singers and the poets and the artists who can best articulate where we are headed. It will be based upon a widespread consensus that what we are doing in politics and national affairs is no way to live. It will start from the ground up, from local communities and groups who relearn to listen to each other. And now I am going to give, since this is the Oregon Humanities Center, a commercial for the arts and humanities, because indeed they are the origin of this new social contract. And I think that uh, the reason for that is that power comes from ideas. According to poet William Butler Yeats, rhetoric is the argument you have with others. Poetry is the argument you have with yourself. A poem includes everything that the poet has ever, ever seen, known, or experienced. It is the dark glass to self-understanding. Poetry is a quest to make sense of the senseless, to plump, plumb mystery, uncertainty, and doubt. Poet Jane Hirschfield uses the analogy of an ocean swimmer waving. Those on shore wave back, but the swimmer isn't waving. She is drowning. The second reason that poets and singers and writers and artists will help us with the new social contract is that the arts encompass emotion. There is a theory called the emotional theory of importance. And basically it is what brings tears to your eyes is what's important to you. Reason is persuasive to some, but when reason is not persuasive, emotion sometimes is. Art is always first voice. You won't find good artists or humanists following the crowd because they do the thinking themselves and they don't leave it to others. And that's why they are so critical 
to the health of our society. Art and humanities confront. Art has moral authority to call out falsehood and pretension and injustice. And in these days of value-free religion, this role is particularly important. Art educates. When you look at children who honestly read a poem or recite in a theater, they are leaving themselves bare and are, are entering into a contract with the audience, uh, leaving themselves vulnerable, vulnerable and expecting the audience to react. And by doing so, they are becoming citizens. Together, arts teach creativity. They teach people to fail and to rebound from failure and to fail again and to rebound again. Art gives hope through music and dance and visual arts and folk songs and films and plays. Art can lower the heart rate, relieve stress, comfort, re comfort reduce anxiety, and just plain make us feel better. The humanities comprise the best thinking humans have done over all of our history. And why would we not want to absorb that wisdom? Of course, not all artists always feel that way. Uh, the famous composer Rossini was heard to say as he left the opera house, you can't judge Wagner's lone grin upon just one hearing, and I, for one, certainly never intend to hear it again. W.D. Ross wrote a book called The Right and the Good in 1930, in which he explained that we have prima facie duties to other members of society Included, including promise keeping, kindness, respect for personal dignity and the like. Prima facie means self-evident. How you might ask, can there be self-evident duties when we're all operating with our own set of facts? My guess is that we're not all that different from each other. And if we could sit around a table and actually talk, and by that I mean listen, we would find that out. What appeals to me from Ross's thought is that these duties should be known to all and protected for the good of society. In our age of Twitter and selfies and 15 minutes of fame and total self-absorption, egos have metastasized into a social disease. But beyond ourselves is the inherent knowledge that what I should do cannot be separated from what is good for all of society. This is one of existentialist philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre's main arguments. So then I would like to just recount some of the lawyer's skills that can help the poets and artists and humanists in this new social contract. The skills that lawyers possess can help us foremost in these skills is the ability to see both sides of an argument and therefore to mediate the most outlandish of claims. Lawyers are problem solvers. I always felt during my time as a trial lawyer that no matter how much I enjoyed the combat of the trial, the fact that we were unable to resolve the case was something of a personal failure. Lawyers are required to exercise independent judgment and as such are well positioned if they choose to be as peacemakers. Lawyers serve and advise not-for-profit organizations, many of whom exist to make our society more inclusive, compassionate, and just. We can distinguish between self-interest and selfish interest. We as lawyers can respect confidentiality, one of the main ingredients of individual dignity. And lawyers are required by the Oregon Rules of Professional Conduct 3.4 to be fair to others and by Oregon Revised Statutes 9.460 sub 4 to uphold the cause of the oppressed and the defenseless. Lawyers are professional listeners, questioners, and advocates. These are but a few of the skills of the lawyer, lawyering profession that when turned toward the cause of a more healthy society can unify legal and philosophical ethics. How ought I to live? In harmony is a good start with my neighbors, with my fellow citizens, with my natural world and all of its creatures, in harmony with the metaphysical values of justice, truth, and beauty. 
If anything in the moral universe is hardwired into all human beings, it is a fundamental sense of fairness. Let's start there. The last portion of this talk is, uh, has got a subtitle that says, if I got to call the shots, um, I have some suggestions of how we might make our society better. Some are ethical, some are political, all are pipe dreams, unless. Number one, there are eight of these, by the way. Democracy is not a spectator sport. And the way you get to love your country is to do something for it. Therefore, I propose national service for a year for every person who attains the age of 18. Number two, everyone, that is each individual, each corporation, each business of any kind shall pay some amount of tax to our government each year. We all benefit from our government and we should all pay for it. Nobody gets by for free. Number three, everyone should be eager to sing the national anthem. Since when did our national song become a performance piece where we stand dumbly and listen to the latest dipsy doodles of some performer? No, it doesn't matter if you can sing, shout out those words as if it meant something to you. Number four, on a prescribed day every year, everyone should be required to take the citizenship exam. Here are some sample questions. Name one US territory. Who under the constitution can veto a bill? Name one state that borders on Mexico. What does freedom of religion mean? Who is commander in chief of the military? How many senators are there? What is one thing for which Benjamin Franklin is famous? What year was the constitution written? How'd you do? I have to recount one instance in which I was uh, at a uh, dinner in Washington DC when I was chairman of the Arts Endowment and uh, a lady whom I knew and I will not identify uh, turns to her partner on the, on the other side who happened to be a Senator and said, tell me Senator, how many senators are there from Nebraska? Okay, number five, one day per year should be national no driving day. Number six, ethics instruction should be mandatory in school curricula. I uh, spent, uh, when I was reasonably notorious after I left the Arts Endowment, um, a few years going to colleges and universities uh, around the country talking. And uh, one of the things that I always asked was, do you have any ethical instruction that's required at this school? And there were only two schools out of maybe 125 that I visited that actually required ethics for all students. Uh, and I think that that's a great loss. Uh, I know we have problems with establishment of religion and so forth, but I think that eth ethics can be taught outside of the religious uh, and, and, and religion can be taught um, historically and, and in ways that are not uh, uh, proselytization. Uh, I, I think we make a great mistake if we think that ethics are inherent uh, and somehow everybody knows because everybody clearly doesn't. Number seven, <clears throat> every five years, all corporations should have to prove that they have paid taxes and otherwise been responsible citizens to continue to do business in the United States. Disqualifying activities would be polluting, unfair labor practices, harmful products, and the like. And finally, number eight, campaigns for political office would be limited to 10 weeks before the election. And while a candidate could spend unlimited amounts, those expenditures could only be made during that 10 week period. While none of these, uh, if they would pass con constitutional muster, muster uh, and if instituted would fix what ails us, Business as usual is not an option if we want to keep our democracy and protect our constitution. Just because we can't make it perfect doesn't mean we can't make it better. Artist Eugene Delacroix put it this way, artists who seek perfection in everything are those who can attain it in nothing. 
Okay, that's thank it. You, thank you, John. A, a wonderful, timely, uh, bracing talk. Uh, I really appreciate it. And I, I will say that as the director of the Oregon Humanities Center, your defense of the arts and the humanities is music to my ears. Uh, uh, we couldn't have, we couldn't support that sentiment more strongly uh, than you put it. And uh, I want to thank you so much. Um, feel free, those of you in the audience, to type in your uh, questions for John. I will relate them to him. Uh, John, I, I'd like to ask you a question. Um, have you ever thought of running for office? Uh, actually, I did run for office in uh, 2008. I ran as an independent for the U.S. Senate, which everyone I knew told me was a fool's errand, and it proved to be exactly that. Um, it, it was interesting um, because I was polling in the polling that we were able to do with our very limited funds, uh, equivalent with, with uh, Gordon Smith, who was then the senator, and um, also equivalent with Jeff Merkley, who ultimately won the election. Uh, but I didn't have 20 million bucks, and that's what it would have taken uh, to stay in the race. Plus, there was this, this great fear that I would be a spoiler and, um, you know, there, that's, that's a legitimate uh, issue. Um, I, I do think that, that our political parties um, have shot themselves in the foot in the sense that they have um, thought it much more important to be a member of the Republican or Democratic Party than to be a citizen uh, under our Constitution. Um, and if that's the way political parties continue to operate, I can guarantee you that at least the younger generation is not going to want to have anything to do with them. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Uh, let me ask you another question. I, we haven't gotten any questions in from the audience, but um, can you say a little bit more about why you think the um, the article was rejected? It seems to me such a timely and compelling uh, thing that you've written, and I'm 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 really shocked that they wouldn't want to publish it. Uh, it's I just can't understand it. Well, I was I was likewise shocked. I, when I read that email, I thought, what? <laughs> but. But uh, here is what troubled uh, the editor. Um, there is something called the Keller decision, which is a Supreme Court decision that came out a number of years ago that basically said that if you are required by law to belong to a particular organization, be it a labor union or a state bar, which lawyers in Oregon are required to do, then you cannot be forced to have your dues money support political ideas with which you may disagree. Um, I read the Keller decision. I didn't know about the Keller decision until um, he pointed that out to me. So I read it and it has a specific exclusion for ethical instruction, but okay. Um, I think that there is just a fear uh, that, you know, it's lawyers just want to be comfortable and they're not comfortable with change. And this is uh, kind of a, a barn burner of an idea and, you know, it just seems to me that the ideas that you're putting forward are um, just and right. <laughs> I don't see why anyone would not want to listen to someone who's speaking truth. Yeah. Well, you know, legal ethics are, 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 are <clears throat> only ethics in the, in the most uh, uh, vague sense. Uh, I can remember one opinion uh, during the time that I was practicing that, that uh, um, was dealing with the question of not if it's okay to sleep with your client, but when it was okay to sleep with your client. So I mean, you know, I think that the ethical universe of, of, of professional ethics is is really quite different. Now, <clears throat> um, the uh, profession that has done very well with ethics, in my view, is the medical profession. Uh, there are lots of ethicists. Um, Courtney Campbell at Oregon State, for example, is an expert in the philosophy of of uh, medical ethics, and, and there's lots of thought about that. And one of the things that actually uh, moved the whole field of ethics forward in terms of general uh, uh, gender equality uh, was, was the idea that um, one shouldn't have to just do what the doctor says, but that the patient ought to have, surprise, some say in his or her care um, and the caring ethic uh, has really invaded and I think greatly improved medical practice. I think it's clear from the behavior of the first responders and the doctors and the nurses uh, dealing with the COVID crisis that they are absolutely um, examples of ethical behavior every single day. 
Well, and, and one of the things that's salutary about that, in my view, is that it helps us redefine heroism. I mean, you know, heroism has always been, I think, in a male-dominated universe, uh, war-related. And, and here we have uh, peacetime heroes who are uh, our neighbors and our friends and who are sacrificing themselves for us. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's real heroism, in my view. So uh, some questions are coming in. Let me ask you the first one. Uh, what has to happen to get corporations such as Amazon to pay taxes? Well, you know, first of all, uh, Congress has to uh, r revise the tax laws because what has happened and the reason that the tax law is thousands of pages long is that corporations that have enough money or any, any entity that has enough money um, can hire lobbyists who go in there and often the lobbyists are the ones who actually write the laws and then the senator or representative says okay and puts his or her name on it and off it goes and and so that's that's one of the issues uh, but but I think that there is some hopeful uh, there's there's some hopeful signs out there and this actually I think predates the uh, COVID-19 but the uh, business roundtable, uh, and I think there were like 161 or 181 businesses that sort of signed on to the idea that a corporation should have a broader reach and a broader mandate than simply to return profits to the shareholders. Uh, and that would include fairness to the society, uh, not polluting the earth, uh, fairness to the workers, and issues such as that. So, it, you know, it isn't that this is not being heard. It is that there isn't the political will at this point to do anything about it. And I'll give you one example. And that is that uh, the, uh, the uh, first Tax Relief Act of 2017 had some, um, some uh, give and takes between the Republicans and the Democrats. And one of them was the, uh, the uh, loss carryback rules for uh, corporations. And in this late, the second, the $2.2 trillion um, thing that was just passed, um, those rules were relaxed again. So there are billions literally of dollars of corporate savings uh, in this tax relief uh, program. And, you know, the beat goes on. If, if you've got the political juice, uh, you know, the tax code is going to continue to be as unfair as it is. So that that response uh, gets to this question, which is a tough question. Can you say more about how we create the new social contract? Is it based on your eight criteria? Well, I mean, the eight criteria are, are a little tongue in cheek, but not entirely. I mean, I think what I think what happens is that we do what we're doing right this very minute, uh, which is to talk to each other about what we think is important. And, and I really think that what's gonna happen is that it's gonna come up from the bottom. I don't, I don't see Washington, uh, you know, sort of suddenly uh, getting religion here and, and, and doing things that are right for the right reason. Um, so we have to A, elect people who believe as we do, uh, B, we have to, talk to our neighbors. Um, and I think one of the things that, that, that is really important here is that it's always been true in American society, what we call polite society, to not talk about religion and politics. We got to talk about those. Those are what matter. Those are what, what, what really uh, have a lot to do with how we view the world. And, you know, we're not very good at listening. And that, that's a very big part of, of free speech. So, that's where I think we really, really have to uh, have to put our shoulder to it and, and, and make it happen. Can you touch, uh, since you've just mentioned about the eight points, uh, we have a question ab about your point about the national anthem. How do you see the current methods of the way people relate to the national anthem affecting society? Uh, uh, presentational, present you know, Super Bowl presentations versus your suggestions about how you might change that? Well, I mean, I think the Super Bowl, uh, Super Bowl type of presentation is soulless. Uh, it, it, it's vacuous. Uh, it's entertainment, but uh, it doesn't say anything about who we are. And no matter how many rockets you send up or how many airplanes you have flying over, what really is real uh, about 
America is recall the, 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 the picture of the African-American man with a tear running down his cheek as he witnessed Franklin Delano, Delano Roosevelt's uh, funeral cortege going by. I mean, that's, that's patriotism in my view. And it, it, it goes along with the idea of doing something for your country to be a patriot. I mean, you know, the idea that a lot of people put yellow uh, ribbons on the back of their cars during the Gulf War um, annoyed the hell out of me because that was um, entirely free. I mean, you were not given up anything to do that. And, and symbolically, it just made me mad. Um, I, I, I think that by singing, we, our voices unify each other. In, in Estonia, every five years, there, there are um, gatherings of 30,000 singers who sing patriotic songs and another 100,000 people in the audience. And, and believe me, um, nobody comes away with that, uh, from that without feeling as if uh, you're a part of something. And, and, and singing does that, singing together does that. Hmm. Um, I just want to let you know that one of our viewers uh, uh, agrees with you that that article should have been published, that uh, the, the lawyers could have been free to read it or not, and that the challenge would have uh, to discuss ethics in the legal profession would have been a very good thing. Um, I have a question from a sophomore at South Eugene High School. And the question is, what do you think the best course of action would be for a high school student in preparing to pursue a career as a lawyer? My advice to you uh, would be to get as broad an education as you can, um, because the law really is everywhere. And the more you know about history, the more you know about science, the more you know about the arts, um, the better prepared you are to deal with the entire panoply of the law. One of the things that law school does is to give you a real sense of, of the reach of the law. And then you as an individual decide what's in most interesting to you and narrow your focus for your practice. Uh, so, so my advice is take what, what you're interested in in your um, high school and undergraduate years and any uh, other education that you give you yourself um, and then um, you know, go to law school and see what you like. But the other thing, uh, about law is that it's called the practice of law for a very good reason. Uh, and that is we are practicing the entire time. And that's true of education too. I mean, your education should never stop. Um, given uh, your repeated comments about the uh, in need for this change, this new social contract to come from the bottom up, uh, one of the questions we've received is how would you move the discussion of issues from being looked at from a political perspective to a moral one so that we could in fact uh, uh, get the kinds of accomplish some of these goals that you have single payer health care or something like that how do you move the discussion in that direction when it's it's all discussion public discussion has become so politicized well i think actually covid-19 has uh, given us some real opportunities opportunities there because um, I have participated in a number of Zoom talks like this with my friends. Um, and I, I think that um, one of the things that you can't avoid knowing uh, during a pandemic is that life is short. Uh, and if we want to stay mad at each other, um, you know, I guess we could do that. But uh, why would we want to? So I, I think that there are um, not just the added impetus of, of our all having to stay home for a while and hopefully think about things, but um, a sense that there are an awful lot of people that we just took for granted, like uh, our uh, fire and police and our nurses and our uh, store clerks and, and the people that drive the trucks. Um, and I, I think with an increased appreciation of what those people are doing for us, um, there, there is a real opportunity for us to start to hear each other. From your mouth to God's ears. Um, I have a question that was sent to me privately, but I'll share it uh, with you. And it, it gets to a point that you raised early in your talk where you, you said that uh, two branches of the government, uh, the judicial and the legislative, uh, 
must deal with truth. But uh, what happens when the executive doesn't? I remember when you said that to me when we first started talking about this talk, I, I wondered if it's if that still applies to the legislative branch. And the question that we received was, um, do you have any comment on the fact that when an inv individual gets elected to office by a margin of, say, 52 to 48 percent, why do they behave as if 99 percent of the people elected them? Don't they have an, a few? Uh, what's happened to a sense that they represent all the people, including the people that didn't vote for them? Yeah, you know, there, there, there are two things about that. Uh, the first is what you articulated, <clears throat> and that is that uh, the, the whole idea of American democracy, as is articulated in Federalist 10 by Madison, was that you have this architecture of one person representing a number of different factions. And the, and the idea is that that person, by having to represent all of them, uh, will knock the rough, rough edges off um, the, the most extreme and will keep the majority from trampling on the rights of the minority. Um, I think that that's long forgotten in the kind of action that you describe. Um, but there is another major part of democracy and that is that democracy really depends upon the consent of the losers. Um, you know, if, well, I mean, President Trump was talking like this when he thought he was gonna lose in 2016. You know, the election is rigged and it's not gonna, and, and the idea was then he's setting up uh, the, the platform for him after the election to say, you know, it wasn't fair and I should have been elected. Well, it turns out he, he won. Um, and, but that kind of talk is hugely divisive um, because it does require everybody after the election's over to say, okay, um, we're not happy with what happened, but we're going to go ahead and we'll beat you next time. Uh, and if we lose that, then say goodbye to democracy. Another question, why have you urged your friends to dump their political parties? Because of the universal chicken heartedness of both political parties, um, they are much more interested in winning uh, than they are in, the, in, in a, any kind of uh, consistent ideology. And I'll give you a very good example of that is go back and look at the platforms of the political parties in the last, I don't know, 10 uh, elections, presidential elections, and you will find all sorts of inconsistencies in those platforms. You know, what the Republicans championed last time, uh, the Democrats are championing and this time and the Republicans are dead set against it and vice versa. Um, and it, it is a, uh, there, there is no ideological consistency there. Um, and uh, it, it, it is more important for many to be a member of that party than it is to be a citizen. Um, for example, um, and I don't know that, you know, maybe it's unfair to criticize him for this, but I remembered my jaw dropping when he said it. And that's Vice President Pence, when he was running, was asked what he was. And he said, a Christian first, a, I'm not, the last two may, may not be in order, a uh, father secondly, and a Republican third. You know, how about a citizen? Where does that fit in there? Yeah. Um Say a little bit more about your sense of the importance of um, having ethics and citizenship be back in the classroom. Why is that so important? Well, I mean, you know, there, there are a lot of things that are not inherent. Um, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Uh, you know, there are an awful lot of truths that aren't self-evident. And, and one of the things that ethics does, and, and this is true of the study of philosophy generally, is that you go back and look at what thinkers from the pre-Socratics to uh, Aristotle and, and, and Plato, and then up through uh, the Middle Ages and, and to the current thinkers like Martin Luther King Jr. and um, uh, the, the American optimists like Dewey and James. And you see that people have, I have um, danced with these ideas that are kind of going through your head. Uh, and that gives you a validation because in my view, ethics is really nothing more than preparation. 
It's mental preparation of thinking through situations before they actually happen to you. And, and I mean, it's my view that lying is, is unless you're you know, a, a, a congenital liar or you don't know the truth from falsehood, uh, lying is often because one is taken by surprise by some situation. And the first thing that comes to mind, oh my God, I'm in trouble here. And so you create a lie. And then of course you have to go continue to lie um, to, to maintain the lie. Um, ethics is thinking about situations before you're in the swamp. Uh, and, and, you know, yes, things will change and yes, it won't be what you expected. And yes, you will have all sorts of surprises. But if you have sort of set out that, that uh, moral framework, and then you will at least be able to deal uh, with issues. And you know what, it, what ethics deals with is always questions that are gray. I mean, there, there are very few black and whites. So we've just gotten a question from uh, one of our uh, viewers who is a grassroots Democrat and in the medical profession who feels that they have to start the social contract with their behavior at meetings and bring up the basic principles you, John, have been talking about so clearly is that what you're what you mean by uh, creating this new social contract from the ground up? And this questioner is is looking for all the ways that they, as a senior, can still contribute to our society. Uh, uh, the answer is uh, affirmative, absolutely. I mean, and and wherever. I mean, there's no good. There's no bad place really to talk about uh, uh, the issues that matter to us. Um, and that's why I say that, you know, the, the idea of polite society or Oregon polite or whatever, um, you know, we don't have to be rude, but we do have to be definite. And we have to, to I mean, it, you know, it's, it's sort of like, you know, smiling meekly if somebody utters a, a, a racist remark. I mean, I just, um, you know, maybe it's because I'm a curmudgeon, but, you know, I'm, I'm not prepared to stand still for that. And, and, and you can do it kind of nicely. You can say, gee, that sounds like a racist remark, is it? You wouldn't do that. You know, I mean, it's, it, it, it's, it's we, we have to be what we want to be here. You also mentioned uh, a point that uh, is related to the one you just made about speaking up. And that is the importance of listening. And it seems to me that in our society, that's become very difficult. To listen has become very difficult. Do you have any advice about how we can build our listening skills up again? Yeah. You know, I, I was at a uh, thing in Texas years and years ago. Um, and the two people on the panel were um, Phyllis Schlafly of uh, the American Family Association, and the lady that, whose name I can't remember right now who argued Roe versus Wade at the Supreme Court. And um, the moderator was a, uh, she was a, uh, I think she was a Presbyterian minister. And so, you know, the, the spitballs are flying back and forth and, and the two are not talking to each other, they're talking past each other. And, you know, this part of the audience is clapping and that part of the audience is clapping and so forth. She said, I want both of you to tell, tell the other person what you think her argument is and then ask her if you got it right. And neither one of them wanted to say anything because they weren't interested in, in hearing the other thing, uh, the other person's argument. They were interested in beating up on each other. I, you know, I think, I think listening is very tough. Uh, it's a skill that... Uh, that along with our short attention spans uh, is, is diminishing in our society, but we got to listen. I couldn't agree more. I actually have a sign. I used to have a sign in my office that said, listen, so that I would pay more attention to what my students were saying to me. Yeah. Um, uh, do it. Does anyone have any more questions for John? We're, we're coming to about a half an hour of questioning time. I'm not seeing any more. I just want to give uh, people a chance if there are any more to come. Well, I uh, hope you will all join me in thanking John Fronmeyer for a really, uh, oh, wait, here's one. Thank you so much for, oh, that's, yes. Uh, this is somebody who's who's uh, watching from Ithaca, New York. Hi. Uh, that's where Cornell is. Uh, so the, I, the one thing that had just come through is that people would love to see a written version of this talk. Would you consider getting it published somewhere else or letting us publish it somehow or publishing it on your website? Um, I, I am the biggest klutz in the world. Uh, 
but I will try to get it on my website. I will send it to you, Paul, and you can do whatever you want to with it. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, uh, everyone, let, let's join me silently in, in thanking John Fronmeyer for this really wonderful talk and for uh, sharing your thoughts, which are bracing and uh, timely and useful and uplifting. Uh, it's been a tremendous pleasure for us. Um, for those of you who have been watching and listening, uh, if you'd like to learn more uh, about upcoming events sponsored by the Oregon Humanities Center, or if you'd like to contribute to the center to support our public and research programs, you can do both of those things by going to our website, ohc.uoregon.edu. Thanks, John. Again, it was a tremendous pleasure, and thanks for everyone for joining us. Bye. Okay.